So this is unfortunately a video I had hoped I would never need to make, but I thought I owed it to you guys to give you an update on what happened with my E90 BMW 335i. So if we just jump back to November 2023, I was driving my E86 Z4 at the time and I decided I was, I was ready for a change. I'd done everything that I really wanted to do with that car. So I started looking on Auto Trader. I'd always really liked the idea of an E90 335i and I felt like it was maybe an itch that I needed to scratch. So looking around online, I managed to find a really, really nice example, or at least what I thought was a really nice example. It was a 2011, it was a four door and it had the N55 engine. Now I've obviously done a video talking a bit more in depth on why I actually bought that car and I'll link that above so you can go and check it out. But basically to summarize, I'd been through that whole weighing up procedure, I guess, of N54 versus N55. Like I say, I really wanted to just try the E90 335i and I knew that it was gonna be a short ownership period. I ended up going for the N55 car. Of course, the N55 sounds brilliant. The particular car I was interested in was actually located in Manchester, which is a couple of hours away from where I'm based. And I went over there initially, had a look around the car, test drove it. Everything seemed really good. It was a low mileage example, had about 45,000 miles, almost entirely BMW main dealer history. The only period that it didn't have is about the last 18 months, but I still had service history for that time period. So everything looked great. The car drove really well. It sounded great. The engine felt good. The gearbox felt good. And yeah, I was really, really happy with the car. So a week later, I went to pick it up, bought it. And bearing in mind that I'd, I'd really gone to find sort of the best example that I could. So I was paying a good amount of money for this. This isn't, wasn't, wasn't a cheap 335i by any means. And I was really looking to find kind of the best that I could. So that was the story behind buying my E90 335i. I was really, really happy with the car. Obviously, this is a slightly different style of video to what we usually do. There are gonna be timestamps on the timeline of the video so you can skip ahead to sort of see what my advice is. But first of all, I just wanna talk around what actually went wrong with the car. And really this is just to educate you guys and you can sort of understand the things that you might need to look out for if you're in the market for one of these cars. So in the next part of the video, I'll talk through the things that didn't quite go to plan. The first two weeks of the car were brilliant. Everything seems to be going fine. The only slight issue that I noticed and really this was just on the very cold mornings, was a slightly rough idle on the cold starts. It seemed to be hunting for RPM. It couldn't quite settle down, but after sort of 30 seconds or so, it was absolutely fine. I didn't experience any more issues really. It was just completely normal. However, after about two weeks, the coolant light came on and that was a little bit concerning, but you know, buying this car, I'd, I'd always maybe come to expect that there could be some problems with the cooling system. They're obviously a bit notorious for that. And we will we'll go on to, some of the common issues with these cars and specifically the N55 later on in the video, as I say. So initially what I did is I opened up the expansion tank. It was definitely not a sensor. It looked like the level was, was very low. So I topped it off and then just monitored it because at that point I didn't know what the problem was. Was it just that it hadn't been filled correctly from when I bought it or was this a much more serious issue? And of course, at this point, I knew that it could be anything really from a leaking pipe to a leaking radiator to potentially a head gasket. So I was a little bit nervous about this. But as I say, I persevered, I just monitored it. And unfortunately, about two weeks later again, the coolant light came on. This is about 200 miles of driving. So at that point, I knew there was definitely a leak, but the good news was that it was pretty slow. Now, at the same time, I'd started to notice a bit of a squeak from the front of the car on particularly cold starts and when the engine was cold. And it was quite clearly the serpentine belt or the auxiliary belt. So that made me think, is there a possibility that that's being contaminated with coolant? And when the engine's up to temperature, it's obviously burning that off and the squeaking sound would eventually stop. But that made me think that the coolant leaks probably somewhere on the front of the engine, maybe the radiator or maybe one of the pipes, or it could even be, who knows, the water pump or something like that. Now I bought the car from a dealer, which basically meant that I had some third party warranty on it. And given that at this point, I didn't really know the extent of the issues. I'd only just got the car. I was a little bit nervous about what could be wrong here. So I thought I'm just gonna do everything by the book. I contacted the warranty company. I got it booked in at one of their authorized repairers. And you know that the repairer wasn't a BMW specialist, but I thought this is probably just going to be a radiator leak, or at least we can just get it diagnosed initially. And if it becomes something that's much more serious, then it can go to a specialist and, and that's fine. Unfortunately, this happened right around Christmas, so I had to wait a little bit, but I knew that wasn't a major problem because I wouldn't be driving the car that much. So I could just top off the coolant and just be careful with it. 
So shortly after Christmas, I managed to get the car in to the mechanic. And within a couple of days, they sort of diagnosed what the problem was. And they said that they identified basically a small coolant leak. I did also ask them to look at the rough idle issue. They said they couldn't find anything. So it, it just didn't make me too concerned at that point about, about that particular issue, but we'll, we'll come on to that later in the video. Anyway, fast forward a bit, they ordered in a radiator and then this is where I started to get a little bit more concerned. This to me was a job that should be done within a few days, but unfortunately this kept getting dragged out and dragged out and dragged out. They weren't keeping me up to date with what was happening with the car. And I was starting to get quite nervous because I was thinking, do these guys actually know what they're doing? Is there a more serious problem that they're just not telling me about? So anyway, after trying to contact them a few times, they eventually said that they'd ordered the wrong radiator. I thought, okay, fair enough. This is hopefully gonna get sorted now. But then it took another, I'd say week or so for them to get this done. Again, they weren't keeping me up to date at all with what was going on. They would say it would be ready the next day. They wouldn't contact me. So yeah, again, I was starting to get quite concerned about it. Basically, it took them about two weeks to get this radiator replaced. And when they called me to say the car was ready, I was obviously very pleased. I was like, finally, we can get it back and move on. However, they said that the car appeared to develop a gearbox fault and they couldn't get it in reverse. Um, and they weren't sure what it was, but they suspected it could be a failed clutch pack. Again, this, this was concerning to me. I, the car hadn't moved. It had been sat in their garage for some time, obviously while they were doing the work. So I couldn't really understand how the gearbox had gone from being absolutely fine. You know, I'd driven the car a few hundred miles at this point. I knew the gearbox was fine before that to suddenly now it's got a failed clutch pack, even more weirdly, just on the reverse pack. However, when I went to pick up the car, that was very obviously not the problem. Uh, it was basically undrivable. So the first thing I did is I just got it trailered straight up to a gearbox specialist, not too far from where I'm based and asked them to take a look at it. Now, when it got there, Again, this is where things take an even more concerning twist because one of their first things they said to me, and this is pretty much an exact quote, it does not look like a mechanic has worked on this car. Now as an owner and an enthusiast and someone that cares about their cars, that's pretty gutting to hear. And it's also quite alarming because it makes you wonder, okay, these guys have been playing around in the front of that car. I don't know exactly what they've been doing, but Anyway, the coolant leak did appear to be fixed. The issues were just that they hadn't correctly fitted the bumper. They hadn't correctly fitted the radiator. They appeared to have damaged the transmission cooler and transmission cooler lines. Now I'm not an expert on this, but I understand the transmission cooler basically needs to be disconnected from the shroud in order to replace the radiator. So yeah, that had all been damaged and there appeared to be some fixings missing as well. So nuts, bolts, screws, things like that. So I was really disappointed about this. Um, and essentially this gearbox specialist said, you know, we're able to help you out with it. It's going to take us some time to sort of just work out what's missing, but we'll get everything ordered and we'll get it put back together properly. Um, in terms of the gearbox issue, it appeared that what happened is a significant amount of fluid out of the transmission had been allowed to leak out. Now it's very difficult to sort of definitively say what has gone on with that first repair job. However, I suspect that when they've disconnected the transmission cooler, perhaps they've taken off one of the cooler lines and allowed some of the fluid to leak out. Perhaps they've damaged one of the lines. I'm honestly not too sure. But either way, there was a, a very significant amount, multiple liters of transmission fluids that had basically been allowed to leak out and therefore the transmission was well below the required level, which is what was causing the fault codes and it not to engage any gears. So anyway, the first thing the gearbox specialist did is they topped off the fluid and everything seemed to be fine with the gearbox, thankfully. But there was, as I say, damage to the transmission cooler and transmission cooler lines, which had been routed incorrectly. So they ordered in all the new parts. It did take them a while to identify everything because they were having to essentially consult parts diagrams and work out what was missing and what was not on a job that they didn't originally do. So this took some time and I knew I was paying for all of this out of pocket. There was no way the warranty company was going to cover any of this. My only hope was really when I had the full picture of what had happened was to go back to the original mechanic. Anyway, they also advised to do a transmission service, obviously just to flush out as much of that old fluid as possible, change the filters just to make sure we're standing in as, as good stead as possible. And they said that there didn't appear to be any problems with the transmission itself. They'd actually done some electronic tests on it and everything seemed to be within spec. So no real concerns, the car drove perfectly fine. 
Anyway, this obviously ended up being quite a sizable bill. Um, you know, there was quite a bit of work and, and labor involved to, to get the car back to a point where it was drivable. And by this point, by the time I got the car finally back, I think this had taken between six and seven weeks. So this was sort of mid February, I think, and the car went in kind of right at the start of January. So a very significant amount of time I'd been without the 335i basically that entire time. So this was <laughs> a little bit difficult to stomach. It certainly impacted my experience with the car, but I figured that this had just been a bad experience. I've been really unlucky and I wanted to move forward and, and try and enjoy the car as much as I could. So at this point, you know, I hadn't even owned the car three months, so I didn't, I didn't want to just get rid of it. I did go back to the original mechanic that worked on it and said, this is what the specialist found, you know, what's the explanation for this? Unfortunately, they were just in complete denial um, and we didn't really get anywhere. They weren't interested in helping me out at all. So I eventually just had to let that go. Um, it was just taking up far too much time and I, and I knew it was ultimately going to be quite difficult to prove that the work they'd done was causing these problems because we just didn't have that level of evidence. And just who knows, it, it, become, it can become a minefield if you start going down that route. So anyway, picked up the car. Everything seemed to be working fine with it, but I obviously still had this rough idle issue. And I, and I did notice that over time, it seemed to have gotten worse. And it wasn't just a case of it now doing it on cold starts, but although it did still do it on cold starts and, and probably was worse than it was before, I also occasionally noticed it when coming to a stop and the revs came back to idle, it would sometimes stumble a little bit and you just feel it vibrate the car and, and not quite running right. But there were no engine management lights at all. Now, in and amongst all of this going on, I had actually, the original warranty had basically elapsed and I'd put a BMW warranty on it because with the age of the car and the mileage of it, um, it actually was quite good value and I knew that was the best warranty out there. Obviously, I, di I didn't know what issues, if any, the car had because the original mechanic couldn't, couldn't find any problems with the rough idle. And as far as I was concerned, everything else was sorted. So I thought, you know, I'm still experiencing this problem. I, I don't really know what it is. There's no engine management light but I'm gonna take it to BMW now that I've got this warranty and I'm just gonna see if they can at least have a look at it and give some indication of what the problem was. They had a look and there were two main codes that were coming up in the DME basically. And one of them was to do with the Valtronic servo motor and the other one was to do with a DME internal fault in relation to the activation of the Valtronic system. Both of these a little bit concerning, but the symptoms I had really didn't suggest much of a problem with the Valvetronic system, to be honest. The car actually ran fine like 95% of the time. It was just occasionally it had some problems. Originally, I was just thinking this could be a vacuum leak. Potentially, it needed new spark plugs. It's just something quite basic like that. But these codes started to make me think perhaps there is something else wrong. It did actually take a couple of trips to BMW to get this issue diagnosed. There was a variety of reasons for that. So we're talking like a few months basically because I had to book an appointment and wait. So again, all of this is just taking a lot of time. Now the car finally went into BMW at the end of July for the repair work. And essentially what they suggested was it probably needs a new Valvetronic harness, so the wiring harness, because that appeared to be in relation to the one of the fault codes. And they said it may also need a new Valvetronic servo motor. Doing some research online, quite common issues to be honest the Valtronic systems can be a little bit finicky and the car you know was sort of 12 13 years old so I wasn't really surprised that it might need a Valtronic servo motor and I didn't think too much of it it wasn't going to be a ridiculously expensive repair job however this is where things start to go really from bad to, to sort of worse really they stripped the car down and they found that the oil pipe that lubricates the Valtronic system I can put some pictures of this up on screen but they found that it had been installed incorrectly at a previous point in time. And essentially what happened is it had been chewed up by the mechanism to the point where it was no longer lubricating anything at all. So essentially this system was running dry. Now we all knew straight away that given I'd had these rough idle issues from the start and no one had obviously been underneath the valve cover because to be honest, there's a lot of labor involved just to get to the servo motor. There's a lot of stuff that needs to come off. So as far as I know, no one has been in there since I bought the car. And this definitely looks like a problem that existed before I bought the car, especially given when I started to experience the issues. So initially they said, okay, let's just replace the servo motor and the wiring harness. But when they started to dig into it a little bit further, it was obvious that the eccentric shaft gear was also damaged. Now, just for a bit of background on the Valvetronic system, this is essentially a variable valve lift system. So you have an electronic motor, 
that actuates a shaft that can rotate and essentially this shaft can increase or decrease the leverage that the rockers have on the valves which essentially allows you to vary the amount of lift. So it's quite a complicated system and, and as I say, it's quite sensitive to lubrication, especially if it's run without proper lubrication for some time, which it appears had been the case with my car. So as I say, the eccentric shaft was damaged. I think there were some of the bearings as well that that sits on were damaged and essentially this all needs to be replaced. Now, this is a big job. If, if you're not familiar with the N55, you know, there's a lot of labor involved with this. We're talking well over 3000 pounds to do this. The parts are expensive and the labor is expensive and also I was kind of now cornered because this car was at BMW, which fair enough, that might be my own doing and I should have maybe thought about that a bit more before I took it there, but hindsight is a wonderful thing. So anyway, um, when I got this diagnosis, I contacted the original dealer saying, you know, this is everything they've found. To me, it's pretty obvious that these problems existed from the start. Here's the fault codes that I had way earlier in the year, um, this, that, and the other. Originally, he wasn't interested in helping at all but when I provided all the information, he suddenly decided that he would help me. Although that hasn't happened yet, just for clarification. So this all took a very long time to sort out. We're talking sort of four weeks plus really to get the dealer to properly communicate with me and essentially agree in principle to some sort of solution for how we get all this done. But I'll be honest at this point, uh, my ownership experience with the car was very much damaged because it just, it was clear that this was not the car that I thought it was originally. And I was just to be honest, disappointed and, you know, almost gutted uh, to really have, have gone through this when I'd done the research and all of that before buying it. So it was an unfortunate sequence of events, but it actually gets a little bit worse because once I asked BMW to then commence the repair job, they again had a look around some other parts of the engine. They had a look in the, in the cylinders as well, because obviously spark plugs had come out and they found corrosion in two of the cylinders and also some fairly significant corrosion on a certain part of the intake camshaft as well. So again, this was gonna be you know, a significant amount of money to fix and ultimately corrosion in the cylinders, that's really not good. So I knew, unfortunately, my ownership period with the 325i had pretty much come to an end. So at this point, again, we were at another six or seven weeks without the car really not ideal to be honest and I knew that the car had to go I just wanted to get rid of it I didn't I didn't want to drive it again I'd also asked them to just do an oil change while it was in there and they had a look at the filter and they said the filter would collapse because a non OEM filter had been done at the last service which again was before I bought the car so essentially restricted oil flow I was worried about potential rod bearing damage and potential other oil starvation issues so I just knew it, it just had to go I, I, there's no way I'd be comfortable driving the car again I was very nervous about getting it back and having potential further problems. And, you know, unfortunately with these sorts of things with the N55, if things go wrong, it's just thousands of pounds straight away. So yeah, I knew that I had to get out of it. And uh, anyway, I managed to do a deal with the BMW dealership where it was at to get out of that car and get into something else, which there will be a video on that shortly. I'm very excited to, to share that car with you. And I'm hoping it's something that will resonate with enthusiasts as well. So anyway, that is the story of my 335i. As I say, I felt like this is some very useful information that you know could be used by other people that are in the market for one of these cars. But there are some other points that I wanna cover in the next section of the video that I think are key things that you should be aware of if you're in the market for one of these early N55 engines, which you know I'm talking sort of 2010, 2011, but they were used actually in the E90 platform right up until 2013 and across various other BMWs till much, much later as well. So anyway, let's jump into that. I think the key point, which I've already kind of briefly touched on, is there's two types of E90 335i. So the early ones had the N54, and then in around 2010, they switched to the N55 engine. The main difference is that N54 was a twin turbo unit, and the N55 is a single turbo unit. It's kind of the next generation turbocharged petrol inline six. Pros and cons of each, uh, there's a lot of debate on the internet, which I won't go into too much here. I've kind of briefly referenced it in the review that I did on my 335i, but I think basically there's different reasons why someone would choose an N54 over an N55 and vice versa. And really it's down to personal choice. In this particular piece of advice that I'm gonna give you, this is speaking purely from my perspective as a previous N55 owner. Now onto the N55 specifically, there were multiple variants of it. Um, as I say, I think the first ones probably came out sort of late 2009. 
the E90 335i started using it from 2010, but there was, they were also used in the E82 135i as well. And actually they were used across a whole different range of BMWs, I think as late as 2019. Um, so anyway, you know, there's been a lot of variations made over the, the engine's life. I'm going to be talking about the early ones because I think they seem to be the ones that actually have the most problems. The later variants actually seem to be a lot more reliable and a lot of these problems have been fixed. So I think the main thing that seems to come up with the early N55s is rod bearing failure. Now I think you have to kind of look at this in the context of where you're getting the information because on the internet these things seem to be often quite exaggerated but there definitely does seem to be an issue with early N55s and them spinning rod bearings. I think there's a few causes for this. Uh, the main one is the style of oil pickup tube that it has in the sump and it's relatively easy to starve the engine of oil through a high G turn. So if, for example if the car was being used on track or if the oil level wasn't quite right or was too low it just becomes easier to starve the engine of oil and that can result in a spun rod bearing which for the avoidance of doubt could basically be catastrophic engine damage and you might need a complete rebuild or a brand new engine which costs a lot of money. As I've said previously as well, they do seem to be prone, and I think this is probably the case actually with a lot of newer cars too, um, if you're using a non-OEM oil filter, they can collapse and restrict oil flow, which again can create excessive wear on the rod bearings. I think the other thing that's talked about a lot with the N55 engine more generally is the oil change intervals. I think originally BMW had stated something like 15,000 miles between oil change intervals, but the general consensus is that's just far too much, and really you should be doing them every 5,000 miles or annually. Unfortunately, some of these cars have then had, the, uh, in the earlier years of their lives, quite long intervals between oil changes, and again, they just don't seem to like old oil, and it can create excessive wear, and it can create problems with the Valvetronic system, which I'll get onto in a minute. So you just need to be wary of that and you want to ideally be looking for a car that's had frequent oil changes, good filter changes and serviced by a specialist I would say is, is probably a, a must have. Now referring back to some of the issues that I experienced personally in relation to the valve tronic system. So as I've explained that's a variable valve lift system used on a variety of BMW engines. I think it was the second generation of it on the N55. I might be wrong but I know it was used on the N52 as well. It's quite a finicky system. It's quite sensitive to oil changes again and, and the amount of lubrication that's getting if there's problems with the oil pipe that lubricates the system which is obviously the problem that I had. Now that oil pipe can get clogged between long oil change intervals which again can allow the system to run dry and it creates excessive wear on the gears and the eccentric shaft. But there's some other key problems with this system and one of the things that I find most baffling is if you've got a Valvetronic servo motor that's failing or has failed it can draw excessive current from the DME, so the ECU, and it can actually damage the internals of the ECU, which in the worst case scenario might mean you need a brand new ECU, which is a lot of money. I think they're well over a thousand pounds. I think there are repair sort of people out there that can do repairs on them. But again, it, it's just quite strange to me that there isn't some kind of a, a fuse in place that would prevent that from happening, because sometimes these valve tronic failures can actually happen quite subtly to the point where you, you don't really know what the problem is. And as I say, I think you just want to be wary about the eccentric shaft replacements because it, it, it is an expensive job. Now, obviously in my case, I didn't have any engine management lights or anything like that in relation to the Valvetronic issues. So I think it's again, just something to be mindful of. And, and my advice basically would be, if you're looking really at any car, but specifically in this case, you need to invest in a code reader and take it to view the car and plug it in while you're there and see what codes are on the system. It's not a completely foolproof way of doing it because codes can be cleared and sometimes they don't necessarily come back straight away. But I think it's just worth doing because sometimes these issues can be there and you might have absolutely no idea. The car might be sort of 95% running fine, but it could have quite a major problem with it. So just something to be mindful of. Another thing that comes up with a lot of older BMWs, but I think in particular the sort of N55 and, and cars around that era, sort of the early 2010s, late 2000s, is the cooling systems. They just seem to be such a weak spot on BMWs. And we're talking anything from expansion tanks to water pumps, to radiators, to coolant pipes. There was a lot of plastic used in these systems. And I think after enough heat cycles, they can fracture, there can be leaks that appear. Now on the N55, one of the things that comes up quite a lot is the electric water pump. So it's not a belt driven pump, it's actually an electric pump. 
These tend to go sort of around the 65 to 75,000 mile mark, but obviously it really depends on the usage of the car. I don't think it's ridiculously expensive to fix that, but it's, it's not gonna be cheap. Expansion tanks, they like to spring a leak as well. And as I say, in, in my case, I obviously had a radiator leak, but there's some certain areas on the front of the engine. I think it's something referred to as the Mickey Mouse flange, which is a plastic flange where you've got several pipes coming in. They can tend to, to fail as well. And of course, these are the sorts of things that could leave you stranded somewhere. So it's just something to be wary of. Generally, the advice would be that if you're doing a repair to the cooling system, it might be worth going through it in full to get everything sorted out. Otherwise, you're just gonna be sort of paying for labor multiple times. Now, being a BMW, it is certainly not afraid to leak some oil here and there either. There's some common ones, valve cover gasket, oil pan gasket, but another one that comes up a lot is the oil filter housing gasket. So basically what you have is where the oil filter bolts in or screws in on the front of the engine, there's kind of like a flange that bolts to the block. You have coolant running through there and you have oil running through there on one side. The gasket can go on that, which can mean you have either sort of just an oil leak leaking down the front of the engine, or in some cases you could even have coolant and oil mixing. If the coolant and the oil were to mix, when you open the expansion tank, you will see essentially a, a layer of oil on the top. So it's, it's fairly easy to see. And also an, an oil filter housing gasket that's leaking oil down the front of the engine is fairly easy to see. You would just need to shine a torch down there. But there is a particular point to note with that. If you leave it for long enough, which is highly advisable to not do, it can contaminate the serpentine belt. And in the worst cases, it can cause it to slip off the pulley and be ingested into the front of the engine through the, the crankshaft seal, basically, which in the worst case scenario could cause a catastrophic engine failure. So uh, if you do see any leaks, you need to get that fixed ASAP, basically, just to avoid any really major problems. And again, I think it's something I would just regularly inspect it. I, I don't think you need to be stressing like mad over it, but I would just sort of every so often have a look in the front of the engine and see if you can see any leaks, because yeah, you don't want that happening. I think one final thing I just want to mention in reference to the early N55 again specifically is high pressure fuel pump failure. There's basically an O-ring within the fuel pump that can fail over time and lead to a loss of fuel pressure. And you'll probably notice this just by sort of difficulty on cold starts. You might get some engine management lights or a warning and it, it'll basically create rough running and probably issues with the engine running at all, to be honest. It, it should be fairly obvious, but the problem is it, it's quite an expensive fix. I believe BMW updated the high pressure fuel pump design around 2014. So the later N55s won't have this problem, but it's just something to be wary of because it's quite an expensive fix, as I say. So anyway, that really concludes the things I would want to say around the N55. I think if we're talking more generally about the E90, obviously these are older BMWs. You need to just be mindful of potential electrical issues. Um, you know, there's a lot of electronics on these cars and over time it's quite common for things to go a bit wrong. I think a code reader that can read directly from the OBD port is a very worthwhile investment. There's some good ones out there. I think the Carly adapter is a pretty good, pretty good choice. Um, that'll allow you to just potentially see any issues that aren't readily apparent, but also a pre-purchase inspection is, is a good way to go as well so that you can have a mechanic thoroughly look at the car beforehand. Not every place or person is gonna let you do that to their car, but <laughs> I would definitely push for it so that you can make sure the car is sound because ultimately you're probably going to be spending a decent amount of money on one of these 335i's but the main thing is you want a car that's been well maintained regular oil changes well looked after and if it drives well you're probably going to be fine i've been incredibly unlucky in my situation as i say i don't want this video to sort of come across as all doom and gloom because actually these cars are fantastic when they're working well my experience unfortunately was tarnished by the specific problems that i had and basically the nightmare of trying to get all of this fixed because um, yeah, it was just completely unexpected. And I'd, as I say, I'd gone out to buy a car that was ultimately the best example that I could find. So in general, just disappointing. But anyway, I hope you found this video useful. I know it's not our usual style of content, but hopefully there's some good tips in there that will just give you a bit more confidence if you're going into the market for one of these cars. And yeah, just, just don't be afraid to, to go and search the car that, that you really want to drive because I think that's the important thing don't be put off by these things. You know, there's a lot of good examples out there. Yes, there's some that really are not good and should be avoided, but there are still some good examples out there. So anyway, that's gonna conclude this video. I hope you've enjoyed. Please do stay tuned for the next video on my new car, which I'm very looking forward to sharing with you. And also please subscribe because that would help us out massively in terms of the content that we can do in the future. 
So that's all from me in this one. Thanks very much for watching. I will see you in the next video.